I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, Taste Lecture by the Department of Economics. I'd like to welcome all of you, even if even though I can't see you. So, uh, to spare a thought of my predicament, I'm lecturing to the void. I'm sure you're there and you're listening to me, but um, you know, I can't see a thing. Um, I'd like to give you a sense of what the economics department is about and what kind of education you might expect at postgraduate level uh, with us. So I'll do it by discussing some substantive issues of uh, economic uh, theory. But before that, I'd like to tell you at the outset that the Soviet economics department is quite unique. You might not see that reflected in um, the usual rankings that come out and basically weigh universities by the kilo across the world. Um, you might not see that there, but there are good reasons for it. Um, but those of you who follow economics and political economy will know already that SOA stands out at, at graduate level. And it stands out um, with good reason um, because it offers you a training in economics that you are likely to get uh, in much of the rest of the world. It is actually quite unique because fundamentally it will train you in mainstream economics. You'll be a competent mainstream economist when you leave us. But um, it also trains you in political economy and in development economics. So it gives you an understanding of economic theory, applied economics, and in a sense, the world economy um, gives you an understanding of these things, which is quite specific to SOAS. You can't mistake SOAS graduates for anyone else. I can assure you, they stand out. Whereas the graduates of most other universities, you can permute and <laughs> compute in, in, in many ways. Uh, they are often indistinguishable. If you are a SOAS um, graduate, you will stand out, I can assure you. Um, so that much about uh, SOAS and blowing um, our own trumpet, as it were, um, which I suppose is excusable in the circumstances. Um, so let me tell you, um, let me tell you a couple of things uh, of substance about what we do. Um, traditionally, we've been um, we've been very good at development economics combined with political economy, but obviously that has had uh, an undertow of, um, in a sense, critical perspective and heterodoxy built in. And so increasingly, uh, we also offer that as a separate uh, specialization at master's level. If you don't wanna do development economics, you simply do an MSc in economics, which will train you uh, in mainstream and heterodox theory. Um, so in a sense, we've separated that out. But for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on development economics and, and indicate the type of critical approach that we generally are, uh, adopt here. So in what way are we different? Let me say at the outset, in a sense, I'll begin with what I'm gonna finish, that uh, the dominant approach in, in, in development economics today, if you go to the uh, IMF or the World Bank or any of the, uh, the, the, the grand multilaterals that uh, shape um, policy uh, across much of the developing world and so on, if you go there, the dominant approach is what we might still call the Washington Consensus. Um, it hasn't got the grandeur that it used to have. It's not accepted the way it used to be. Um, again, for good reason, because there have been successive crises that have uh, diminished its stature. But nonetheless, that's the bedrock. It's basically um, mainstream neoclassical economics that shapes the thinking of um, uh, economists involved with the world economy in developing countries, uh, an approach that basically says markets are the best solution for most things and, and free flows of um, factors of production, capital, labor, and so on, um, is the way to go. Um, I'll, I'll finish with that. But in order to um, make you see why that is dominant, we've got to go back. And, and we've got to, in a sense, um, have a quick look at the trajectory of uh, thought in development economics uh, and understand and appreciate why we ended up where we are with this kind of approach. Uh, and that is very much typical of what we do at SOAS. We will give you this kind of depth of historical uh, 
understanding of why we ended up with this kind of um, uh, dominant approach, which uh, has not always been dominant, incidentally. It's dominant the last 30, 40 years. So why? Well, let's go back a bit. But before we go back, let's clarify a couple of ideas about growth and development. These are two different uh, concepts, although very closely related. So I will use them in a conventional way, nothing, nothing terribly uh, radical in terms of how I will deploy the concepts. So growth would basically be, for my purposes here, a kind of quantitative change of some basic, um, uh, some basic uh, uh, factors, some basic variables. So output, capital, labor, and so on. Um, growth then would be quantitative change uh, by and large. Economy is getting bigger. Development on the other hand, uh, would obviously involve quantitative change, would obviously involve growth, but it would be much more than growth. It would also be qualitative change. It would be a shift away from, say, a, a, a condition of pre-development, underdevelopment, backwardness, to use a, a, a very old fashioned term uh, when it comes to that, uh, towards modernity, towards development, towards, uh, towards the developed state of, state, state of the world and whatever you're gonna call it. Another way of putting it is, uh, development is a shift towards market capitalism, basically. Okay, the, the shift towards advanced market capitalism, which basically means uh, markets developing internationally, markets developing domestically, and the most important market there would be uh, the labor market. People making a living, not from the land that much, but from being employed uh, for wages. Uh, and that would be a state of affairs whereby labor productivity would be rising rapidly and incomes would be increasing and then new forms of inequality um, would be emerging. A new society, in other words. Now, how are, are we to understand this shift, this, this transformation, this, this state of affairs? If you start thinking about that, uh, you won't be able to think much of, of much else, I can assure you, in, in, in economics. Why, why does this happen? Why do we move into this um, state of existence of um, uh, societies? Um, this is not just me asserting it. This is a statement by one of the best known conservative mainstream economists, uh, Robert, Lucas, Robert Lucas, who basically said that once you start thinking about development, you can't think about anything else. And he was right. He was right. Why does it happen then? Well, we could do worse than start with Adam Smith, who, whichever way you slice it, is the foundation stone of um, contemporary economics, whether that is straight economics, political economy, whatever it is. So we can start with Adam Smith and think with Adam Smith, um, because of course he wrote at the time when this process that I've just summed up for you was occurring in England, Britain, actually, more generally, and bits of Northern Europe. And it was just about the only part in, uh, of the world where, where this was happening. And that's what interested Smith. Why is it happening here? W what does this mean? See, his book was called The Wealth of Nations. And that's precisely what he was explaining, the wealth of nations. Why are nations uh, becoming wealthy, meaning entering this process of development that I just outlined for you? And Smith proposed three things. Where he basically said, the reason why this is happening is because human beings are learning first to engage in the division of labor. In other words, specialization. Specialization of, of uh, uh, work, division of labor is the key thing for Smith. And there is no doubt. I mean, we use that in economics all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a decisive insight that uh, Smith had. If you make a pin by yourself, you can make a hundred in a day. If you divide the tasks of pin making, you can make thousands in a day. Um, argument settled. So the division of labor is the key thing. But Smith, of course, so much more than that, much further than that. And he stressed that the degree to, the way to which the division of labor works and is effective depends on the extent of the market. In other words, how effective the division of labor will be depends on how big the market is towards which the product will go. Um, so if you've got narrow markets, you're not going to be doing very well, even if the division of labor 
um, is quite elaborate. So markets and the extent of the market and selling for a big market is a key thing for development for Smith. But if you think about it a little bit more like Smith did, you realize that there's something else that's missing. You can have big markets, you can have division of labor, and still you might, you might not be developing fast. Why? Because the third thing is missing, which is of course capital. Capital is, as I say, accumulated capital to invest uh, in order to catalyze the process, or as Smith called it, stock. So Smith then mentioned these things and they are reference points for all development economics. Um, the need for capital, the need for specialization in, in, in work, and the need for markets in which to um, sell the output. This for Smith should be occurring and should occur in a sense um, spontaneously. See, don't forget, Smith was involved in an argument against what people who were called mercantilists um, before his time. And these mercantilists had a very different view of development and growth. We're not gonna be going into that in development theory. If you do history of economic thought, you might be taught some stuff of uh, this that at source, but not for this purpose. But Smith was engaged in an argument with them. And what was crucial here was to say something about the state, the role of the state. And Smith was very much, in a sense, against direct state intervention in the economy, meaning he was against direct state intervention in these three processes, trying to shape them up. He wasn't against the state in the economy generally. He wasn't against the presence of the state in the economy. Um, the state is there to ensure that this system works without interference, works without um, uh, um, being in a sense warped or um, disfigured. Uh, and that's about it. Okay, it should set the terms uh, of the game, the rules of the game, and then development can um, commence. Smith said a lot more, but I don't have the time. Uh, for us, that's the reference point. Another one of the great thinkers following Smith among the classicals was of course Ricardo, David Ricardo. Ricardo didn't have very much to say about the development process itself. Um, Ricardo was much more in a sense static as an economist. Smith was very dynamic as I've just outlined for you. Ricardo was much more static in his, in his concerns. He really wanted to work out um, the ways and the rules through which this output that kept growing along the lines that Smith suggested, uh, this output was distributed. How is it distributed? Who, who gets shares of it? In other words, how much of this output end, uh, does end up with uh, the capitalists? How much ends up with the workers? How much ends up with the, the landlords? The three great classes uh, of society in Britain uh, at the time and no other societies, not just Britain. Ricardo was very concerned about that, and that's uh, really uh, that really took all his um, attention. In this context, as he was working out what determines wages, profits, and rent, which is another way of putting it, incomes, in other words, um, uh, working out these incomes, Ricardo postulated um, a, a view of the long-term development of this capitalist system, and he was pessimistic. He thought that uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't do very well in the long term. And the reason why it wouldn't do very well is because the rate of profit would fall. The reason why the rate of profit would fall would be because it would be squeezed by a rising population and a falling productivity, marginal product of land as the population expanded. Uh, rate of profit is of course the rate of return on capital. If the rate of return on capital declines, clearly capitalists will not invest. If capitalists do not invest, then you don't have much development and certainly not much growth. So uh, um, for Ricardo, uh, the long-term prospects of capitalism, given the division between labor, capitalism, uh, labor uh, workers, capitalists, and landlords in society wasn't very good. Then the last of the classical economists or, or neoclassical economists that we will be dealing with is of course uh, Marx. For Marx, the perspective was actually quite different. Um, now you can talk about Marx for weeks on end, but for our purposes, I'll talk, I'll talk about him for about five minutes. Um, and clearly he learned a lot from Smith and Ricardo and from others. His own point about this process uh, was actually different to both Smith and Ricardo. 
he was partly dynamic, like Smith, and partly static, like Ricardo. He wanted to work out distribution issues. And the key distribution issue for Marx was, of course, profits. What determines profits? Um, Ricardo was also very concerned about profits, as I've said, but Marx looked into profits uh, very deeply. And that's his only contribution in an original way, which of course is not accepted by most other economists because he associated profit with unpaid labor. He basically argued that profits come from unpaid labor. Not many economists accept that. And certainly not, uh, um, it's not generally accepted uh, in society. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a powerful contribution. The import of which for our purposes is this. If profits come from unpaid labor and in this way, then profits are the driving purpose and the driving uh, force of development. Development happens because there are profits. It doesn't happen because people want to create jobs or they want to create output. No, it happens because there are profits to be made and uh, therefore there must be investment because that's how profit comes about. And so, um, for in Marx's analysis of capitalist development, um, the, the secret is to analyze why investment takes place. What is it that drives investment? And, and there, he had a lot of interesting things to say that have to do with uh, competition between enterprises, between capitalists, how you succeed in competition. What does this mean for um, technology, the introduction of new technology? What does it mean for the productivity of labor, raising the productivity of labor in order to succeed in competition? And what are the implications for profitability uh, as you do that? Because of course the point is profit. Um, Marx's argument then was that capitalism is very dynamic. It is a system that really catalyzes um, uh, the growth process and the development process, but it's also very unequal and driven with crisis as this process uh, takes place, inequality emerges and crises um, keep uh, appearing. And you might say that that's an insight that uh, has a lot to tell us about the modern world. So not much about the great, in a sense, classicals, but obviously development economics, uh, as we know it today, um, learns from these uh, people, but uh, works differently and has, more specific roots and the specific roots that it has for our purposes but also more generally lie in the interwar years of the 20th century yeah it, we learn from the classical theories of the 19th century but the real foundation uh, for development theory and development economics uh, are the interwar years of the 20th century the, the years between the first and the second world war where when um, very many important things happened and one of the important, the most important things for us uh, as development economists and development theorists was, of course, Latin American structuralism. Um, that is in an important way um, a foundation stone for development economics. Now, I want you to cast your mind um, back to that time and realize why uh, that period was so important. Um, in the 1930s, the world market and the world economy was in deep crisis. Um, Capitalism in the United States had, um, in a sense, crashed. Um, Europe was in deep trouble in terms of economic performance. Unemployment was very high. Production was low. Um, the world market was fragmenting into different components. Trade yet shrunk. Credit was doing very badly. Incomes were falling. Uh, it was a very difficult time for working people and, and others more generally. Uh, in that context, um, a group of economists in Latin America, associated with Raul Trebesh and many others, began to think uh, of um, what causes this and what are the implications for their countries? What does it mean for uh, Brazil? What does it mean for Argentina? What does it mean for Latin America? Uh, what does this situation mean for these countries? And what should they do in order to uh, uh, enter a path of development, uh, deal with this crisis and go down a path that would allow them to um, increase production, increase output, increase employment and increase um, the incomes um, uh, uh, of their people. It's in this context that structuralism emerged. 
Structuralism here has got many meanings, and we can discuss Latin American structuralism for a long time, which of course we're not going to do today. But um, structuralism takes its name from the fact that these economists send, uh, stress the import of economic structure for understanding why development might or might not take place. And the uh, import of structure, uh, structure is, um, is um, um, uh, straightforward. What did the economies of Latin America look like? They had for these structuralists a problematic structure. That's where the name comes from. Why? Because they had a traditional agricultural sector, which had uh, low technique and low labor productivity. And um, often this agricultural sector was dominated by big farms run by um, landlords uh, not very effectively with low technique and uh, uh, low labor productivity. They had a modern industrial sector, um, which was often, often um, associated with foreign capital, foreign enterprises coming in and uh, uh, engaging in this uh, modern industrial sector. And the output was uh, aimed for export. So that sector required imports of capital goods in order to function, technology to come from abroad. They had a low level of technical know-how. Uh, know-how would come from abroad. No, technical knowledge would come from uh, mostly from abroad. They had um, um, several domestic rigidities of supply. In other words, um, agriculture would not be able to respond rapidly to changes because of the large farms operating in a certain way. Um, the modern sector would not be able to respond quickly to changes in conditions in the world economy because it would be dominated by foreign firms and it would be not uh, technologically advanced and producing its own technology and so on. So it would be, uh, there would be rigidities uh, of the economy. And last and crucial point, these economies would have a high elasticity uh, income elasticity of imports. In other words, as soon as the development process started, given these structures, what would happen would be incomes would begin to rise a bit. And as incomes rose a bit, imports would rise uh, into the country. Imports, both partly of, of capital goods for production, but also of consumer goods um, for the um, uh, urban population and, and more generally um, that would like to consume foreign consumer goods. As soon as that happened, a stop would emerge in the development process because imported goods would have to be paid for. The country would not generate enough surplus to do that. Uh, and then the mechanism would go into reverse. It would be blocked. In that context then, Latin America structuralists came up with the development uh, policy, which gave its name to this approach and was characterized development economics for decades. And the argument was the structure must change, right? For the structure to change, policy was necessary. The structure would not change by itself. The government had to make it change. So immediately you see a key difference with the classical theorists. This wasn't a process that would happen by itself. Someone had to make it happen. There had to be development policy, in other words. And the, the development policy had to aim a change in the structure. What did that mean? Well, this was a difficult choice. And the way they resolved it at the time um, was um, the following. The emphasis should be on what they called a light industry. Uh, that's what should be promoted domestically. Um, to promote that, you needed a policy that would protect domestic production. For that, you needed import controls. You needed to, you needed to ring fence the economy to a certain extent from precisely the process that I outlined previously, the incoming of, of imports that would create the difficulties. So, um, so uh, import controls were necessary. And uh, in addition to import controls, what was also necessary was government support for domestic industry uh, to allow it to produce for the domestic market. And that meant um, credit support and tax support and institutional support generally 
a whole, an entire, an entire range of measures and policies that, that would be aimed at strengthening domestic industry and allowing, allowing it to, to, to capture the domestic market. Um, and and, and on, on that basis begin to grow. Um, inputs were also necessary for this as I indicated, but they would be inputs of capital goods, investment goods in order to support industry, not consumer goods. These would be produced um, domestically. So uh, there was a lot more, which I haven't got time to cover here, um, but that was the basic, um, that, 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 was, that was the basic um, um, uh, idea. Now, uh, in that context, um, rising wages were not a bad thing because rising wages would, pro would create a domestic market for, um, for consumer goods, for the light um, um, uh, uh, industry. And um, so that could also be part of the development strategy. Um, and the role of the government was of um, crucial importance, as I've already indicated, to supervise the process, to manage it, and to organize it. Now, there were many different uh, variants of this. I, I've simplified brutally here just to, just to convey the main point. But that's the gist of it. So input substituting industrialization um, was the key idea. Um, if you actually look into the history of thought, you can identify elements of that approach long before the Latin American structuralists. Um, for instance, there are uh, German theorists, list above all, who uh, began to think along those lines already from the middle of the 19th century. Um, the idea that if you really wanted to join um, the, the advanced countries, Germany was not particularly advanced at that time, you really needed to protect it and use the state in order to do that. So these ideas go back some time, but the, um, the most systematic approach for our purposes can be found uh, in the work of the Latin American um, structuralists. One further key point here is um, regards finance, which I've already mentioned. Um, credit was also very important uh, for, to this process for the structuralists and credit meant um, developing a credit system that um, would support precisely this process and that meant the bank-based system, a system of banks that would be controlled by, um, by public authorities uh, or they would operate within a, a system of public uh, regulation and they would support the process of growth um, and development that I previously outlined by channeling savings to investment and by creating credit that would allow businesses and capitalists uh, to invest along the lines that I suggested. But now, this approach in different ways became prevalent um, in the post-war years. Not necessarily uh, in exactly the same way that Raoul Prebisch thought, uh, thought it, or other Latin Americans began to discuss it back in the 30s or even in the 40s, uh, but uh, recognizably so in the, six, in the 50s, 60s, and much of the 70s. Um, those years, were very peculiar years in the history of capitalism. And they were peculiar not only for developing countries, but also for developed countries. Because you see, what happened in the United States at that time, or in Britain, in France, and in Japan, and, and elsewhere, what was then the developed world, um, was that controls dominated. These were the years of Keynesianism. Uh, Keynesianism meant state intervention in policy to manage aggregate demand um, and state intervention to supervise in a way the um, growth and, and development process and crucially state intervention to control finance. These were years of controlled finance, controlled domestically and controlled internationally. Um, these were the years in which um, the global flow of capital was not free. Um, it was not possible to take your money from one country and move it to another in a matter of minutes, um, if at all. Um, these were unusual years. 
There were also years with the most rapid growth in the history of capitalism, incidentally, and the most rapid growth of incomes uh, for people. So when you hear about the uh, delights of liberalization that followed, you, you should always remember that the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s were unique years in terms of um, income growth and equality and so on. That's the context in which the import substituting industrialization uh, theory prevailed among uh, development theorists. It was the, the characteristic approach. Um, and in that context, what also um, happened was that foreign aid for development became very important. Uh, why? Well, cast your mind to it. Capital doesn't flow freely because controls stop it from doing that, as I've already explained. Capital doesn't flow, flow. There is no such thing as a global capital market, which now dominates everything. It didn't exist. Um, if capital doesn't flow freely, and you put yourself in the shoes of a developing country, then as soon as the development process starts, as I've outlined it, or as Prebish would have outlined it, um, imports might grow. If imports grow, uh, and exports don't grow commensurately, the country will have a problem because it will have a balance of trade deficit. And someone has to finance the deficit. Capital must come from somewhere uh, in order to finance the deficit. So if you really want to continue with the process of rapid investment, which means imports, which means a deficit, someone has to be financing the deficit. Uh, and that meant foreign aid. So that's the context in which foreign aid was then, back then, discussed as a vital element of um, development policy. Um, and that's how the World Bank began to be thought of back, back in the day. Um, that's presumably um, something that the World Bank um, had to do. That's how the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s functioned, not particularly successfully for developing countries, incidentally. The growth process was not particularly strong and some development theorists, especially those who came from the Marxist tradition, began to talk of the development of underdevelopment. In other words, as this was happening, certain groups of countries were becoming entrenched in low development. Um, so the world was um, splitting into this uh, developed core and then underdeveloped um, periphery. Um, that was the state of affairs um, until the 70s. What happened in the 70s was of dramatic importance. And in a sense, we continue to live, to live in the same period. That's basically, we, we haven't actually come out of the period that began in the 70s. And what happened in the 70s was, of course, a major, a series of major crises in um, the developed world. The oil crisis of 73, 74, crisis that followed afterwards. The end of Keynesianism, basically. And the rise of, um, in a sense, neoliberalism, uh, the idea that the state has got no business in uh, economic affairs and it must withdraw and it must simply act as um, a night watchman. I'm simplifying again, but I want to convey the main idea. For developing countries, this was of decisive importance. It was of decisive importance in the field of theory, but also in the field of practice. In the field of theory, which, is ma which matters to us because you have to be taught it, what happened was um, neoclassical economics began to notice the development process. Until then, they were not terribly interested in it, neoclassical economists. They were not terribly interested in development economics. But in the 70s, they began to look at it more closely. And you, you began to get neoclassical treatments, mainstream treatments of the development process. And of course, as neoclassicals always do, the thing that they noticed was that there was something which was very clearly absent from the analysis of, say, the Latin American structuralists and all the others, political economists and others who discussed the development process in the way that I summed up for you before. And that was, of course, price. And price is the key economic variable for neoclassical economists, right? Economics is about price. What determines price and how? But price was absent uh, in, the, in the structuralist process. Uh, what mattered to structuralists and others was the structure. In other words, 
agriculture industry, the, 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 the international sector, how they interact with each other, the flows and so on. Price wasn't very important there. And neoclassical said, no, that cannot be. That's not right. Price is what's key. And obviously, if you start with that, then you go down a very different path. Because if you go down, down that road, uh, that neoclassical economics likes to go down, um, price is very important because price makes ensures the efficient allocation of resources if price is freely determined. The analysis of demand and supply tells you precisely this. Uh, if demand and supply are freely determined for by market agents, then that's the optimal allocation of resources and not just of the good that we're talking about, but also of the factors of production that went into the production of the good. Okay, because choices are freely made and agents will make their choices uh, in a rational way and everybody will leave the market happy, uh, equilibrium. So that was the key thing, which meant from that perspective, if you want the development, you have to let prices be determined freely. Let prices find their level. That in a sense is the Washington consensus. If you think about it, that's basically it. Um, if you really wanted to condense it in one sentence. Um, development will happen when markets operate freely and prices can actually reflect relative scarcities. They can reflect the conditions of uh, uh, economy broadly uh, understood as the agents perceive it and the agents act. Well, the implications were dramatic because if that if that's the if that's the thinking, if that's how you approach development policy, you understand that there is no room for development policy. Development policy is basically to absent yourself from development. It is it is actually to to take a back seat and let. Um, millions of development theorists get on with it, basically. Um, the field in which this emerged first was in finance, hence financial deregulation, financial liberalization, because obviously the key price in the financial field is the rate of interest. The rate of interest is a price, right? It's the price of borrowing and lending. Uh, that was very tightly controlled for, for decades until the uh, 70s. And uh, the first terrain in which the freeing of prices took place in a big way was, uh, was in the rate of interest in finance. Let the rate of interest find its level. Now you understand this has got serious implications because if you let the rate of interest find its level, that means that you should stop imposing a ceiling on it. You should stop controlling, you should stop controlling the supply of credit. You should stop uh, inserting yourself in the demand for credit. Um, you should let banks do what they think they should do. Um, you should let uh, people borrow the way they want to borrow. There must not be regulations of quantities of credit and prices uh, of credit. Let them do it. Yeah, but if you let them do it, as we now know, and let them do it any way they like, you will end up with cred credit bubbles. And, 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 and booms and busts. At the time, this wasn't that clear, um, but that was, the, that was the message. So financial deregulation and financial liberalization began in the, in, in the 70s. Along those lines, it was part of the new development economics operating in, in finance. And the idea was, if you let them do it any way they like, then they will save more, they will invest more, they will find the right level of uh, interest and there will be growth and development. As I say, it didn't quite work out that way, but that was the logic. If you start with interest, you're not gonna stop there. Um, because obviously if it holds for one market, it holds for another. And so um, the same idea um, should also apply to um, output markets. Why regulate the production of um, of um, light industry, as the structuralists said. Why regulate the production of consumer goods? Why encourage the output instead? Who are you to choose which industries to support? You understand? That was the logic of it. What does the state know? What, what is the relative advantage of the state in this? Nothing, according to the um, mainstream approach. Therefore, the state mustn't do it. 
deregulate, deregulate the freight uh, markets. So the process of deregulation uh, as policy began in the 70s and gathered speed. Um, ultimately, um, you reach the point when capital itself, the flow of capital itself began to be deregulated. Why regulate the flows of capital? Why tell people how they can shift that money from uh, Brazil to Germany? Why let them do it? Let them free, let them move the money uh, any way they like, uh, and in both directions. Deregulate, in other words, um, the capital account. Let international flows be free. So, financial deregulation led to general deregulation, led gradually to the idea of what was called the Washington Consensus. Uh, gradually, in other words, private is best, market is best. Public doesn't work, state control doesn't work. It should be pushed to the limits. This approach, again, I'm simplifying and I'm being unfair to it to a certain extent, but such is the lot of one hour. Um, but I think I am conveying the gist of it. This approach continues to be, in a sense, the foundation stone. It's the reference point. But obviously, a lot of water has flown under the bridge has flowed under the bridge since the early 70s. And we now know that this mechanism can fail to produce development. Um, it can also produce crises. And uh, we also know theoretically that these markets that are supposed to find um, the level of price uh, that is natural to them can also malfunction. We know that markets fail. And markets fail because of a variety of reasons, transactions costs and uh, information asymmetries and a ho host of other um, factors that might stop them from functioning in the way in which the theory would argue uh, that they should function or that they do function. And therefore, if that's the case, intervention is again necessary because if, ma if markets malfunction, then how would you fix the malfunctioning? Well, you need an authority to do it. That's the way in which critiques of the Washington Consensus began to uh, emerge in theory um, about 20 years ago. But the dominant approach remains, as I said, the Washington Consensus. Um, I can say a lot more about that. And if you come to SOS, you will hear a lot more about it uh, in a more um, in a reasonable pace, uh, with a more reasonable pace. But the, the, the point I want to stress finally is this. All that has been happening while real changes have been taking place underneath as well, not just in theory, but in practice. And of course, the biggest change is Asia, right? East Asia in particular, um, Korea, well, Japan originally, but then Korea, uh, a whole host of countries in Southeast Asia, and of course, the elephant in the room, right? China, um, which is where um, the biggest transformation is taking place. And that has happened the last 40 years. Uh, to a certain extent, this has happened because of markets, production for markets. Anyone who tells you though that this confirms the neoliberal, let them free, let them do it, approach to development would be lying to you because that's not how China developed and that's not how most of these economies developed, okay? It's a peculiar mix of policy that obtained there. Yes, depending on market, but also depending heavily on the state and state control over key areas of the economy um, to do with the fundamental goods, uh, inputs into the production process. And also, of course, the financial system, which has never been, never been let free um, in China. This has posed new issues and new um, uh, questions for development and economics. And that is again, something which you will be discussing uh, and learning uh, more about at SOAS, together with the crisis prone uh, nature of this uh, and the new inequalities that have uh, emerged. Now, I don't wanna say anything uh, much more. It's I, I, I'm acutely aware of time, it's 10 too. So um, um, I think I've said enough to give you a, a flavor of how we do things here. Um, Perhaps I should give you the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, I would freely encourage that. And also to say that 
uh, certainly with my in my uh, courses and in my lectures, uh, interaction is highly valued, and that's how we operate. I keep asking questions and I keep inviting questions from my students. So there you are. You got five minutes to ask all the burning questions you've got and to sort sort out all the problems uh, of the world economy. Uh, thank you so much. And Shansana has been doing a wonderful job holding down the fort um, on the Q&A. We've had a couple of questions um, come in and everybody should be able to see that if they navigate on the Q&A panel to the answered questions, you'll be able to see um, the questions that were submitted and um, Shanzana's responses. But there's been a lot of questions about quantitative elements of the course and um, the maths background that might perhaps be useful for students. Um, and different things there, Costas, if you want to pick up on okay. any of that as well. I can't see, I can't see the questions. I can see one question by Claire. Yeah. Claire McCullough. And Good. then if you go at the top to answer, there should be open, answered, and discussed. Ah, okay, I can see them now. If you click on answered, you'll be able to see all the ones okay, very that has responded to. Very good. Um okay. So let me ask these um, uh, these uh, these um, questions. The the quant element. Now, we will teach you econometrics and quantitative techniques. Uh, there are courses that do it at um, the standard level for us, and the and, and the advanced level. We will teach you microeconometrics and macroeconometrics. Um, you will be competent at using packages and. At, engaging in the standard econometric um, techniques that economics uh, uses. Um, you'd be good at reading and assessing papers and at using the techniques yourself. Uh, and that will be integrated into the general discussion of theory. We, we do not fetishize technique here at SOS. Uh, we give you um, an advanced level, uh, but we integrate it with um, uh, the rest of the stuff that um, that we do. You will learn to assess models and to reproduce models and to work with uh, the econometrics to test models and that's um, good enough uh, for us and for the source economists who will want you to be. Um, now for MSc economics um, the, the focus is slightly different obviously it's not development per se it is a critical perspective of uh, on, on economic theory, it is actually more model focused and focused more on develop on the advanced countries, as it were. Um, you can have options there too. You will have options. You can take some development courses uh, as part of your options for that. Um, but you have to make a decision for yourself uh, where you want the uh, the emphasis to lie. Uh, in terms of area focus. Um, we have historically and still do emphasize area specialization. We've got people who know particular areas very well at SOAS. Um, and they know the areas not simply as data as, as, as data sets, but uh, they know the history, the language, and so on of these areas. And you can, and you will be encouraged to, to look at um, Africa, to look at uh, um, China, depending on what is of interest to you. There are these courses that you can take. Um, area specialization is also very important for us when it comes to um, your dissertation. Um, the dissertation for us can be um, an, a fairly open-ended thing. You can, you can do a quantitative um, um, uh, exercise. You can apply because econometrics is to some data that you will gather yourself or that you, 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 you'll find from some other source. You can do a, a development of a model. You can do a critical review of the literature. You can do a political economy discussion of a particular country. It's uh, open-ended for us. Um, and there, you would be encouraged to have an area focus. Uh, it is always sensible to have an area focus, which um, would stand you in good stead when you look at, when, when, when you finish and you look for jobs. So you'd be able to say, my dissertation is on some aspect of the Africa, or of African economies, for instance, or of um, some Asian economy. In Latin American economies are also acceptable, increasingly. Um, that's about it, really. I don't know if there are any questions that I've left out, have I? 
Um, we probably have time to answer one more question and then we'll have to um, end the session. Um, there's a couple of open questions um, in wow. the front tab, Costas, if you go up to the top and click over to open, you'll see three that ah, haven't been yeah, answered yeah, yet. Yeah. Perhaps if you want to um, choose one of those and I will pop your email in the chat so that if anyone wants to follow up, they can get in touch with you. Um, okay. I'll just answered. say very quickly, I'll just say very uh, the part-time students, no, that's basically the same thing. You can shift the courses a little bit about. In other words, instead of doing four and four, which is the usual, um, the normal split would be four and four, four in the first year, four in the second. You can do three and five under uncertain circumstances. But I wouldn't encourage that unless you've got good reasons for it. Um, other than that, you just follow the same process as anybody else over two years. Um, and on the question about uh, applying insights into policy and so on and what career services are available at source. Policy and applying the, the theory to policy is obviously something you will learn from us. That's what we pay attention to. That's why we do economics the way I sum them up. Um, so yes, policy applications are crucial uh, to us. In terms of career, um, at the MSc level, and again, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, at the MSc level, the quality of SOAS uh, students is world level, okay? The, the students we get are excellent. Uh, we, we can compete with anybody uh, at that level. So the, the mix of students is excellent. And the, the career um, uh, path, paths that they then have uh, reflect that. Uh, even in the midst of the, um, the pandemic last year, most of our graduates, or a lot of our graduates, landed incredible jobs. I couldn't believe it, actually. I thought they would have great difficulty because of what was happening in the labor market. But no, that's not the case. So typically, um, our, our graduates will, um, will work uh, in the private sector with, um, say, big banks or big corporates that want uh, an alternative eye, and there are plenty of those, or in the, with the international uh, multilateral organizations, or they will go back to their own countries and they work in the, um, um, in the development field in their own countries. Um, I can say a lot more about that, but I'm aware of time um, um, coming very short. Yeah. Yeah, um, there was one question about the carrier service. So the carrier zone at, I'll just say it very shortly. Um, there is the SOAS carrier zone who can provide advice on internships, volunteering, and they can also help you with interviews. So you can always email them if you need any help regarding your cover letters, CVs, interviews. Perfect. Thank you so much. We will have to um, end the session. I'm sorry it's a bit abrupt, but we have another one due to start, um, so I don't want to get cut off. I put my email in the chat. Please use that if you have any questions, and then we'll make sure that your questions get to the faculty or to um, anybody that you would like to be pointed in the direction of. But the session will be recorded and available to view in about a week's time. Thank you so much for joining us, and do get in touch if we can help you with anything else. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Lauren Shanzana for supervising this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.